What's up, everybody, and welcome to Why Am I Like This? Uh, it's the 15th of March in Australia, which is where I am. I believe it's still the 14th of March in the USA, which is where most of the people who are joining live are. And it could be pretty much any day of any year for whoever's listening asynchronously because we're going to upload this episode to the Broom Radio podcast, which is a podcast that we have for the Broom, <clears throat> which more or less functions as an archival playlist for the live sessions that we hold in the Broom Radio. And basically up until now, we're uploading all episodes of the Broom Radio to the podcast but we've been talking about making it so that's not the case so that people either have to join the broom discord and participate live or they have to support the broom in some other way perhaps financially in order to gain access to all recordings of the broom radio podcast and we're still kind of uh, marinating on how to make that happen. And I'm sure we'll communicate it somewhat sufficiently before the changes are made. So stay tuned, and hopefully it will be clear for those who want to keep following along with all of the live and recorded episodes of live sessions in the broom. It will be clear for y'all how you can do that but coming back to why am i like this if this is the first time you've been in a why am i like this container which i don't think applies to anyone who's here live but if you're in this container for the first time outside of the time of this container or in other words you're listening to a recording of this then i'll say why am i like this is a series which I was called to put together so that I can transmit responses to questions that are posed to me in a variety of different places, which I felt would suit the purpose of being portals that could open up between, uh, I'll say, like my vaster self and my human self in this incarnation. Um, for the transmission of codes from my vaster self to my human self. And from my human self to whoever listens, and whoever is listening in the unseen. Or specifically in the unseen, which relates to collective realms of, I'll say, mostly human intelligence. And it's okay if that doesn't make complete conceptual sense. Um, I'll say that for this episode of Why Am I Like This, I'm going to bring in, I wouldn't even quite call it a question, I'll say that I'm going to bring in a context, and I'll describe the context a little bit lexically and conceptually in a moment, but first I want to say, or yeah, I'll repeat the guarantee that I normally make at the beginning of why am I like this containers, which is that um, I guarantee that no contexts will be enmeshed in the container of why am I like this. I guarantee that contexts will be disenmeshed in the container of why am I like this. And I guarantee that I will hold space for good faith offerings of feedback, repair, or refinement in relation to the guarantee or in relation to the container in general. 
And um, to describe the context that I'm bringing into this container, I'll say that I'm making a little container inside the astral container of this episode of Why Am I Like This? And if you feel, I'll say like, if you feel like you have the skill and or the capacity to try and square this series of containers which I'm describing, then you're welcome to do that. Um, for those who like aren't getting much from that or aren't going to try and do that, I'll say that the context that I'm bringing into this container relates to a painting of a human speaking to an alien. And um, one of the people who's in the container right now um, was saying that the depiction of the alien felt off in some ways, I'm paraphrasing, um, because the alien was green but did not have the appearance of a mantis. <laughs> and I had responded in some way by saying that in some realms of perception, Sekhmet is considered to be a mantid. I wouldn't say a mantis, and I'm not exactly sure why yet. <clears throat> and then um, Ahmed said, wouldn't most deities basically have like a mantid, um, say like manifestation or incarnation or symbolic representation in some realm of perception? And then um, I felt called to ask if I could bring this context into the container of why am I like this? And Ahmed agreed, so here we are. And then I shared a bunch of information about Sekhmet, which wasn't necessarily like strictly related to the question. But I felt like it made sense to kind of seed the container a little bit. So thank you again, Ahmed, for like letting me bring this question or this context into this container. And I'm looking forward to seeing what comes out of it.
So I guess I'm going to open this container by asking if anybody has any experience with extraterrestrials, or in particular, mantis-based extraterrestrials. If you feel called to share, and you can unmute, <laughs> or if you'd prefer to keep it in the chat, I can read out what you say. And if you want to put something in the chat that you don't want me to read out, just please let me know. I'm just going to hold space. And while you're are responding, I'll say I only allow what is for the cosmic time and I bring forth a light language transmission from the one I know as Sekhmet on um, the topic of convening. And I'll start now. Shia Ratan of Soka de Dereta Musokata Siena Marocata Lesse Cora son of Charlotte in the Siarana kola, kalama saturat, sheta porosatan, kiala kanasam, kiala hama Kana raso, ki atatora sam, ki aratata hashal, kuta sarana kalento, atsarate makala, ki ki ki. So Hmm. 
Kan sarat tana tafte per sakata madrasa tipi terima kata nasate terpe kata fterte. Kukara masatif tip erat nasat anakara pe terima tafteri et anakarmas. Vila taru pa kata sarat ne kati kata nasta terfte mat ona nasate. Kita taporos ta kata psnafte le poro te te kadiana ati ne mshtafte le. Kia ta nama tukara ta kalai sata nefte poru katsa. Shipte patara matukana nefte yate te rusha nas. Kia ta nama nari tam tarea na lo. Kia ta ta poru kata dama nafte tiara ta karashta kata dama nafte pukarak. Kia ta fte peru shta kara mata fte petera mata fte. Tia nama nafte pukuru masa kata fte pene. Kia fte pena nara ea turu shta kana ata la pesa kata rishta. Karata temet efti parukat dia da krashto kde menefti kde. Kita nama tafte petrukat ra petrakat krashto kde dia. Kita hal teruk asal kali terista kala pada dia. Kuras tak nama tafte petakana tafte penafte parukat. Efte pekarista kala ni ada re tafte pekarusak kde menefti. Hafte porukan anak sakit anak mata kena nak kata tiar kata peti mati. Ia nasaf terata ia nila kaduruk. Allah satu pada kena sada tika dia. Shuta dah ruka Allah satu kerah tetap at. At ilah ruka dan masa kedi teruka tashta. Kata le. Kata le. Allah, suk at astarit ashtaf te penanana kato ursa kata de. Hala kato ono su, la kata ya arut ta kura kati ishto arat ea nama sukan. Vila para o pasa te pudure te petaf te pa kura ta. Shata nama nara kati ilay kura ta kata nama sukut. Ketef te eri sa kata ay. Sukara ta te terepe ta kura me shataf te. Hana. Hana Um...
Thanks for the invitation. So, Ahmed, I'm curious if uh, you feel like it's the right time to talk about your experience. Thanks. Uh, I think it's a bit of a long context, just to give you a bit of an idea of like, you know, kind of how I was approaching this, which also extends my reaction to it, and I was sort of ignoring this for the longest time. But um, I think I've shared with you all before, with the, just some of my other experiences, how uh, I've just been very unfamiliar with just like the whole, you know, uh, world of spiritual experiences and sort of what it all entails. So for me, as I've experienced things, it was always sort of going through it the first time as opposed to actually having heard about it or read about it or anything like that. Um, things that happened in childhood, mostly that was precognitive dreams. Didn't know that's a thing until fairly recently. Uh, but then it's the more recent iterations of stuff that started happening, right? That's, I'd say it's part of the, I guess, the more recent awakening process. Um, and I've shared one of them with you, right? So there's there's things that, you know, again, change your mind from just an atheist of just opening up your worldview, uh, the whole mediumship that changes your whole view on sort of life and, you know, uh, death, all that sort of stuff. But then I also shared with you all how I had this mediumship experience, right? With this thing that claimed to be from somewhere, somewhere far away, showed me a, yeah, yeah, blue orb, right? <laughs> Claimed to be from somewhere else, showed me a flying saucer, which is so unex you know so unexpected to me, along a few other images and stuff. Um, and uh, you know, it took me a long time to just accept a lot of these experiences and just accept what was happening. Right, like, I was more veering towards the side of I probably just lost my mind, you know, and trying to get that checked out and all that, <laughs> going to doctors and all. Um, now I, I came to accept a lot of these experiences, including you know. I had an out-of-body experience as well and stuff like that, but it was the whole idea of the whole extraterrestrial side of things that, yeah, I just knew. I was just a little uncomfortable with the idea of it. Just I could just tell it's a personal thing I have, you know, just not as comfortable with. Um, and I didn't mention this, but, you know, I got lots of meaning out of the whole orb experience that you mentioned. And I also want to say one thing. I'm very open to the interpretation of what that was, right? Um, was it a... Because some I've heard from some people, it's sort of like a archangel. I think Michael experience. I heard from some, it's a Kali experience. I heard from some of a ET experience as well of blue orbs. Like it's it's again that that symbology for that's present across a few different places. Mm. And I've had other experiences where I see some of these elements being called. <laughs> so, for example, a few other experiences that harken to Kali um, or other iterations of Kali. I think I was mentioning hell in that. Uh, Chad, that's another experience I've had. Um, mm. So, so it's it's a, and also with the whole ET thing, I also had um, an experience actually in childhood that I always wrote off. But now I'm like, okay, maybe I should get that more validity, you know, and stuff like that. Another experience later on, but again, not as uh, extreme of a thing um, or direct of a thing now. Um, but yeah, that's always been the hardest pill for me to swallow. So. It's it's only after now, at this point, which is where I've now actually been talking to people or reading about these different modalities, you know? So it's not in my previous state of where I don't know anything, just experience it, and then I just have to look it up and see, oh, wow, that's that's a thing. I say that to say that, as I'm going to tell you about this experience, I, that's part of the reason why I wrote it off, because I was wondering, is this an influence of the fact that, hey... You know, I know I have been uncomfortable about it, so I thought about it. And hey, I'm familiar with these other concepts, which is why is that kind of what I'm seeing or experiencing, you know? Mm -hmm. But essentially what happened was uh, many months after all this and many months after... Oh, sorry, I thought I'd mention one more thing. A beautiful thing that came out of the Blue Orb experience, actually, that helped with acceptance of it was one of the images that thing showed me actually connected me to someone. It was someone I met right as that symbol was present right there. And someone was right there who actually wanted to talk to me. I was like, oh, that's very interesting. Started talking to that person and felt this deep connection. And I saw how, again, part of the spiritual journey, right? How you can you meet people that you feel like you're uniquely equipped to help. And then you also see how they're uniquely equipped to help you. Many mm -hmm. times it's vice versa, right? Of what starts off first uh, versus the second. Um, so, yes, yeah, like I got a lot of meaning out of that experience, right? It's so one of deep love for everything else. One of just connecting to this person, helping this person, someone who's helped us as well. Or who's helped me, I mean. 
uh, <laughs> and there's still some meaning left to be said, you know, out of that experience I still haven't deciphered yet. Uh, mm-hmm. And so for me, at first, I thought the whole show me flying saucers is more of a realizing the how, because I never looked into that sort of stuff before. So I think it helped me sort of see the deep spiritual nature of those experiences, right? Um, anyways, so yeah, fast forward a few months. Like I said, a little accepting, being more accepting and trying to, you know, uh, of, of what I've experienced, you know, uh, and of the phenomenon itself, these phenomena and modality itself. Um, but still, something I was uncomfortable with compared to everything else. Now, it was last January. So this is a state of where I'd say every night I'm pretty much lucid dreaming. Um, so as in, I'm always having consciousness in the dream space. Many times it's consciousness throughout the night. So I actually see the dreams arise. Um, so every night I just basically have great memory of my sleep. Um, what was interesting about this particular night was this is the first night. And oh yeah, if I don't have, if I'm not loose dreaming, it's just great recollection of the different individual dreams across that night. So this night was different because uh, I, I kept waking up a few different times where I could tell I had troubling dreams or dreams I felt uncomfortable or something wrong, right? But I wouldn't remember the dream, which was very, very different from, you know, the, the months prior to this. And so I woke up a few different times and I just go back to bed and then again, wake up where I felt very uncomfortable. I felt like it was uncomfortable and just can't remember what it was. That happened a few times. And then at one point I woke up where I look, you know, I just get my glass of water, but I look to my right and I see this body, right? It's, and the way I describe it is, you know, it's like a it's like a thorax and an abdomen. You know, it's it's massive. It's 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 big. You know, it's just round. It's in it's right next to my bed, and that caused me to get alert. So I quickly just you know get up from my bed, and as soon as I do that, what I'm about to tell you next only lasted for about two seconds. But I'm just gonna give you a lot of detail because I remember this very very well. So I see that body. I quickly get up, and I'm instantly I have the, these two eyes in front of my face, and I'm suddenly moved to this you know this state of just very very calm but it was such calm it just felt like an altered state because i I was awake feeling normal like in just normal waking consciousness Mm. um was like the alpha beta state right um but uh Mm. as soon as i get back get you know move up i suddenly have these two big big eyes and it's green i'm a super calm the sound around me is very serene. It's like a very, you know, um, it's a very open sound. But I hear clicks throughout as well, like, you know, like kind of like that. I see a little. I see not just in the eyes. I can see within the inside of the eyes, the, like the bottom inner corner is like a little bit of pink, kind of like how our eyes have, right? In human eyes, mm. and I, even how. It, points down to like a little chin or a mouth, but it was just a super state of just calm, so calm, I f- fall back asleep, but I can feel my body just again falling back into the bed. And that was it, that was the experience. That, the whole thing lasted only two seconds, right? Of just, uh, you know, get, <laughs> get, you know, look to get a glass of water, but then you see this body in front of you, you don't feel it or anything. Quickly get up, super calm and these eyes in front of your face super calm and then you just you feel yourself fall back to sleep and just as you're losing consciousness and boom you just you know you're done and so for me you know the interesting thing is i actually didn't really care or think about much about this experience like when i woke up it was a case of hey that happened last night it felt real realer than real but you know what ahmed you are now actually familiar with uh, the idea of a mantid you are familiar with the idea of, um, you know, things that can project images into you, right? This is a prior experience or, you know, and, and so you can make the logical conclusion that it can also induce states of, of you know, um, just emotion, right? And calm. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah, so you, this is probably a product of, uh, you know, what you've read and since it's been in your mind because you've been uneasy with it and, you know, that's it. But so just, just chill, you know, and you're good. I didn't think about it for another two weeks. And it was only two weeks later where I finally decided, I just saw the incident again. I was like, you know what? Let me actually just look up an image of you know, people's depictions of mantids and let's see if any of them match up with mine, right? And many of them don't because many of them actually have this middle, huge middle part between the eyes, whereas mine didn't. But 
to me, the fact that it was two weeks of just chill and not even, it's not like I'm trying to push it and not think about it. It was more of actually not think about it, actually being chill about it. It was like, that was what I got out of that, that experience of, you know, you've been mm-hmm. wanting to see if you've been chill and you felt like you've not been chill, but hey, here's a case, right? Here's a case of where you have this supposed experience, but it's probably, you know, it's sort of self-induced, right? Um, or like it's something you just thought of as opposed to a legitimate thing. And yet you were chill about it. So you know what? If you want to know if you're fine, yet yeah, you're good now. You know, it's kind of mm-hmm. the meaning I got out of all that. And yeah, it's something I just never thought of after that. Until um, until a few months later, as I just shared the story with maybe a person or another. Um, but that's it. It's the only ever time I ever thought about it. So the interesting thing is, a few weeks ago, I think we shared about the whole feeling called to get back into a practice, right? Asking to heal mm-hmm. and all that sort of stuff. Very crazy weekend. And that's a much longer story, but uh, lots of synchronicities. As I was following the message, things were getting better. As I didn't, I hurt myself even more. <laughs> As Oof. I continued to find the message, yeah. And so what happened that night was very interesting. So that night where I was like, you know what? That's it. I'm just going to give in. Um, that night I actually had another, you know, I was on the precipice of another out-of-body experience, actually. So all of a sudden, just happened. Um, and the next two nights that followed were, again, just nights of very meaningful dreams, actually. Uh, so the out-of-body experience happened in a, in a waking state, but uh, the, other, the other two nights was just a case of where I just woke up, uh, had very meaningful dreams. But in the second night is where, um, for some reason, I just thought back to that magic experience. It just came across my mind as I woke up in the middle of the night. And I was just thinking about, you know, that experience really did feel real, you know, like, the, it, again, like, it's my first time thinking about it in a long time, but I was just thinking about the fact that it did feel so, so real, but I just, I've just written it off this whole time, but I guess that's kind of denying it in a sense, you know? Mm. It's funny because the synchronicities, uh, later that day, just on Twitter, someone just mentioning just a movie trailer and how that, that sound sounds very familiar. Now this is a person who's had similar physical experiences with this sort of stuff. Mm. Not mantid, but just in general. But it's funny because I put that sound on the trailer. It's the exact same sort of clicking sound. You know, it's the like same type, just more frequency than what I heard, right? As in not higher pitch. I mean, it's like more commonly occurring. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, but I was like, wow, let's remind that person of that and this exact same thing that I had. It's funny because I was then talking to someone else and uh, someone I know who's had. And actually, it's funny. I decided to actually talk about this, right? How I just thought about this. And hey, you know, I had that out of my experience. Just another spiritual group or group I people I talk with. And uh it's funny because I was debating if I should talk about it, but then someone else mentioned uh, how they've been told they've had a mental experience, but again, it's one of those that they didn't have consciousness of. It's just something they've been told by a psychic. Like when they were questioning, mm. I had this experience, I have a lot of things around it, don't really know what happened. And then, and then they were told, yep, it's just, it's, it's one of those, you know? <laughs> so I mentioned my experience. So I was like, oh, again, just very, you know, there's a lot of synchronicity there. Um, and then someone else, uh, mentioned their experience where they it seemed like they had a much more involved experience but they had another similar element to what I had which is being lulled into a state of calm but whereas I got calm to a state of sleep his actually went on where they actually communicated and just again he, he just didn't mention too much of it but it seemed like more happened but it was just funny with the synchronicities right or I just suddenly think about this and then you know <laughs> these little things happen of just remind me of it and then I mean, I pretty much brought it on in, in, in the room, but uh, yeah, then you talked about the segment where I was like, oh, that's a very interesting way of looking at it, right? Transmuting that energy. So it's, it's, it's about the whole uh, fact that I moved on, right, from uh, not accepting and being uncomfortable to just being, mm. realizing, all right, no, you're, you're cool, you're chill, you know? So that, that mm. part actually I thought was a very interesting connection there. But mm. that's the whole experience. There you go. That's the whole nature behind the question of the or the folks in the mantid. But I am still curious to know more about the whole, you know, anthropomorphization <laughs> when it occurs to other groups, right, of people as they anthropomorphize. There must mm-hmm. be, if if I do believe, like lemurs are sentient. So I'm sure there must be lemur gods, right? Lemur lemur equivalents of gods, and just for that, for any uh, for any equivalent. So yeah, that's the whole story. Thank you, thank you for sharing. I'm really curious to hear what comes through as well. Um, I'm also holding space if anybody else wants to share any experiences which relate to what Asma has shared and, um, or any reflections on what Asma has shared before I continue. And I have no idea how I'm going to continue right now. I'm just kind of like getting little nudges. Um, 
which relate to experiences I've had. And I would say that there's like some kind of background process, which is assembling different aspects of those experiences into a response. But yeah, thank you so much for sharing. Um, I feel like you did a really good job of putting all of that together into something which is fairly coherent. And I would say that my experiences, which feel like they, I would say come from tapping into like you could say like metaphorically similar bands of consciousness or similar like frequencies of the transmission of intelligence which we sometimes know as consciousness um <clears throat> have a similar kind of nature and i would say like level of detail and i would call it like a feeling of like erraticness which i would say makes it really difficult to relate in words and in linear time to other people. So I just want to reiterate that I felt like you did a really good job of explaining this. Father says, I feel like I'm seeing flashes of my own experiences in my mind's eye. Although I'd also ask like about Hafan's dream routine because I think of, like, I would say, like, most people probably don't experience the level of, like, lucidity or recall that you experience, like, not even close. But I feel like a lot of people really want to. Um, so, yeah, I think that's why Hoda was asking what your routine was. And Ahmed says, building focus and openness slash equanimity. <laughs> Which is like pretty simple, you know, I've seen like people selling like courses about lucid dreaming. I think some of those courses contain transmissions or rituals or group containers where people are like received or put into states of receivership of, um, yeah, I'd say like consciousness codes for lucid dreaming. Um, there are all kinds of like exercises online which are supposed to help people to cultivate yeah, like senses of consciousness, so that they can stay lucid when they realize that they're getting into a dream which they can become lucid when. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, you don't need any of that stuff. When you're just in a default state of being very focused, you'll notice the couch is a different color. Or that you remember going to bed and suddenly you're in a jungle. Which I think like is giving me some insight into I would say like the shape of your field, which is interesting. But I'll say like for me, I don't really experience dreams in that way, or like not even really like generally that close to that way. I'd say like my experience of dreams fluctuates quite a lot. Um often I wake up with a kind of summary state of like the many dreams that I've been a part of. Um, sometimes I'll wake up with just like a few images which represent like some of the dreams which I've been a part of that I kind of need to know about for some reason. But I think it's like very rare that I'm like extremely lucid in a very vivid dream. <clears throat> but um yeah, I guess I'll say that, like, within the container of the context which I brought into this episode of Why Am I Like This, there's sort of, like, two sub-containers, and I think one of those containers pertains to, I'll say, like, symbolic representations of vaster realms. Um, and I'll say, like, symbolic representations of extraterrestrial realms. And then the other container in this container pertains to, like, a segment. <clears throat> and um, immediately after I brought this context into the container of why am I like this, I just felt called to share a little bit of um, lore that I've sort of experienced in my workings with Sekhmet, and I guess I'll say that I first sort of 
started to work with Sekhmet in, I'll say, 2020, when I became involved with a group of people online who I would say, like, loosely refer to themselves as, like, um, the Born Day community, let's say, um, after channel transmissions of somebody named Kensu Nefahatep, who I believe is a psychiatrist in Brooklyn, New York. Um, and he was channeling at the time on Patreon and on Twitter about the lore of like what I call the Walkers of Bluestone, what some people call the Walkers of Bluestone, um, who are a lineage who came out of um, Egypt, let's say. Um, in a period of human history where it's commonly like referred to as like late Atlantis, um, where people who had learnt that there was going to be some kind of cataclysmic event on Earth had started preparing their consciousness for that cataclysmic event so that artifacts of their experience could be related to and excavated after the event. And then also some people, I'd say like mostly Atlantean civilizations, had started to try and document um, like the wisdom of those lineages in order to pass this on physically versus like metaphysically to people who would come after the event. And then I would say in the process of accumulating artifacts of this wisdom, um, some of these like civilizations lost their way a little bit and instead of preparing for the transmission of this wisdom to those who would survive the event or those who would come after the event um from my perspective um they started to use what they'd learned of this wisdom to try and prevent the event or to try and gain an advantage over other beings um, in the lead up to this event and in the preparation for this event. Um, but the Born Day law that was being transmitted related mostly to the days of the, be the week being associated with um, the planets and luminaries um, the Sun, Moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus, and Saturn, um, which relates to, I'll call like, an egregore, which um, defines the rulers of a day which is split into um, 24 hours between sunrise and sunset, and then sunset and sunrise. Um, and based on the order of the planets, which is based on like how quickly they appear to move, from the perspective of Earth, the rules of each of these hours is decided, and then based on the cycling of these hours between sunrise and sunset, and then sunset and sunrise, we end up with day rules, which is also why we have days that we define as Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And in some way, they're all named after planets and luminaries like the sun for Sunday, the moon for Monday. I'd say in like Latin languages, we end up with Martidi or Mars Day, but in Nordic lineages, we end up with Tio's Day because Tio is like a deity who represents Mars. And then instead of um, Jove's Day in Latin languages, we end up with Thursday because Thor is a deity who represents Jupiter. And instead of Venus Day, we end up with Freya's Day because Freya is a deity who represents um, Venus in Nordic culture. And then we end up with Woden's Day instead of Mercury Day, Mercury Day because Odin represents Mercury in Nordic culture. And then Saturn is basically the same. The moon's the same. And the sun's the same. Um, but having become involved with the Born Day community, I learned that I was born on a Venus day. And I learned pretty quickly from people in that community that one of the deities who was associated with um, Venus day is Sekhmet. 
and you know going back to what Ahmed had said about like learning information and then having experiences which I would say like ended up being symbolically represented using symbols that I had come into contact with through receiving that information um, I ended up having like a few different visions over a, you know quite a long period of time involving a lion-headed goddess which is one of the more popular representations of Sekhmet um, and I also felt called on a number of occasions to go and make offerings to statues of Sekhmet in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, um, where I learned that, yeah, according to the Metropolitan Museum of Art, and I would say like many, quote, Egyptologists, unquote, um, Sekhmet is known as a goddess of war, plague, and famine. And um, I would say that this is a fairly distorted understanding of Sekhmet from my perspective. Um, I think it's really interesting that Ahmed had said that Sekhmet's associated with genetics, and I'm going to hold space to see if you want to type or say anything about that, because that's not something I'd heard before, but I would say that it aligns with what I have learned about Sekhmet, either in, I'll say, like the waking dream, or... Um, through direct experience with Sekhmet and other beings, which I would say like either represent the intelligence of sub organs of the body of Sekhmet, or um, I'd say like experiences with the body of Sekhmet in communication with other bodies outside of the body of Sekhmet. Um, on genetics, Ahmed said, just something I read in a two-minute Google search before, how they are related to biology and genetics. That's all the detail I have, sadly. Um, so, yeah. So some of the stuff that I shared with Ahmed before, I open this container in this episode of Why Am I Like This relates to the etymology of Sekhmet, which I'd say comes from two major etymons. One of them is Sechem, which um, has a hieroglyph, but if I had to translate it into like common day English or like current time English, I would say relates to will. Um, and in Wiktionary, it says power and power over. And then the second etymon is just like the dash T, like t, which is sort of like the feminization of um, the previous etymon. So Sekhna together sort of means like the feminine representation of will. And um, what I related to Ahmed in accompaniment to sharing that was that in that context, it felt necessary for me to say that for me, Sekhmet represents, I'd say, like yin power. And, like, in this context, I'll say, like, um, adenosine triphosphate, or what is commonly referred to as like the energetic currency of the cells, which I would say, like, arises from the orchestration of the mitochondria of cells in our body which is mostly um i would say like develops uh in a way that is like most heavily influenced by mitochondrial dna um and Ahmed says what's the meaning slash interpretation of masculine slash feminine here um i would say that for me Masculinity and femininity are sort of egregorically associated with yang and yin, respectively. And I would say that, um, yeah, it feels more aligned for me to say that, like, the energy is sort of like a yin energy, which is to say that 
it's more of like an earthly energy um in relation to like heaven versus earth which is to say that it's like an energy which um is more aligned with like you could say in western systems like black instead of white or you could say it's more aligned with the energy of like the void versus like articulations of the void or for me, I would also say it's more aligned with like a pre-dual state versus articulations in a dualistic state. Um, and it says negative space for me, which makes a lot of sense. Um, also, in some lineages, they'll call it like undifferentiated potential um, versus differenti differentiated and like formalized energy. So as it relates to like ATP or adenosine triphosphate, I'll say that like, for me, again, it's like known sometimes as like the energetic currency of the cells. And my understanding of how it's used between cells, which I'll say is like, I'm not academically educated and I've mostly felt like intuitively called to read like little bits and pieces, but I'll say that like, through the transcription and the transliteration of DNA, ATP ends up having like a signature. So it's almost like used to like, I'll almost like define it as like blank checks, right? And then what we do with checks and what we've been doing with checks for a while is like we make them out to certain people and we make them out in certain amounts. And sometimes we express conditions on these checks. And this is the way that cells interact with other cells in order to um, exchange information. And ultimately, I'll say like orchestrate chains of material and immaterial exchange so that cells can function and help other cells function. Um, so I, I'd say in this context, like adenosine triphosphate is like currency within an economic system and i would say that this is what sekhem is not necessarily like particular functions which are orchestrated with with that currency but the currency itself Ahmed asks so based off the etymology sekhmet's the force of the void or the force of the yet to be realized and yeah once again i'll say i think you get it and I, I w I'm not using those exact words, which is not to say that they're wrong, but um, I think that the words you're using and the words I'm using are like 86 or 87% aligned in the way that they'll probably be received by most people. Um, so, again, like segments, sort of like, to use your terms, like the force of the void or like the motive of the body in which these transactions are occurring, which is not to say that she's not what's orchestrated through these transactions itself, but it's more, I would say, to say that, like, just like you know, that you, Ahmad, most of the people would say, like, this body is Ahmad, and then sometimes this body has dreams of mantises. Sometimes this body is listening to music. Sometimes this body is watching Arsenal play and admiring the skills and the physicality of Martin Odegaard. But just you having that dream does not fully represent you. Or just you watching Martin Odegaard play is not all of Ahmad, right? And I would say in the same way, Sekhmet is kind of like this motive force which sometimes appears as like eating sometimes appears as like making love sometimes appears as plague sometimes appears as famine sometimes appears as war um and i would say like i'm kind of like building a bridge to the other container in this container which is to talk about like symbolic representations of vaster beings or extraterrestrial beings. And I'll continue making that bridge by saying that 
part of the reason that Sekhmet is often thought of as a goddess of war and plague and famine is because you could say that in some ways those were the scripts that we lived out within the realm of Earth on this timeline within the realm of Earth, which I'll describe as a space-time which has many timelines which are informed by many choices, which um, also contains many possibility planes. And I would say which also represents within human consciousness mostly as a kind of vaguely spherical planet which has trees and land and sea on it. But I would say that that's the way that we experience land and sea and wind and blue and green and brown are very coupled to the way that humans have evolved as a part of the space-time of Earth. And the experience of Earth for, let's say, mantids or lions is very different, right? Like, we kind of know that different animals see colors differently. We, when we move from places which are really hot to places which are really cold, we understand that we experience really cold places very differently from people whose ancestors came from mostly cold places. So we can kind of infer um, that different parts of Earth consciousness, which represent as different animals like mantids and lions, may experience the space time of Earth very differently to us. And then I would say that. all of those life forms probably experience like the script of war or plague or famine very differently right like um as like these scripts were playing out within our timeline of the space time which we call earth you probably guess that like the experience of like cicadas and snakes didn't really change all that much whereas like humans were experiencing war and plague and famine while those scripts were playing out. And that's why we end up with a characterization of Sekhmet as a goddess of war and plague and famine in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, Because I would say that like the myth of Sekhmet, which comes to us from, I'll say like Egyptologists of what happened in Egypt, is that the people of Egypt um, would have like rituals and festivals relating to the goddess Sekhmet, which commemorated um, a story, another myth. So this is like a myth of a myth that commemorated a story where Sekhmet is like the hand of the god Ra, and um, you know Ra is unhappy with how humans are behaving. So Sekhmet is invoked um, and creates like a slaughter and ends up like losing control in her task, like maybe like relishing her task too much of like destroying all these humans who've been misbehaving and then needs to be tricked in some myths of myths by um, Tehuti who makes a beer out of the blood of some of these humans and then alcohol which then calms Sekhmet so she stops slaughtering humans. And again, this is like a myth of a myth. But I would say that in my understanding of what was happening within the framework which I've presented, which I'm, or Grant is like a little bit both like vast and dense and a little, um, I'll say, probably like disorganized seeming for perhaps a lot of people who won't listen to this container, and perhaps for a few people who will. But I'll say that what this myth of the myth of these people represents is time, a time on Earth where a cataclysmic event occurred 
because you could say like the body of Earth was sick and had to get rid of certain inflammatory factors within its own body, many of which were human. Um, and the way that this event or these events, which kind of are loosely grouped in as like one cataclysm, played out um, for humans is somewhat akin to like a fever in your body when you're sick, right? Like when we're sick, we often have fever dreams. We may start sweating. We may get chills. We may feel heated up. We may feel like our body's aching. We may have to like rest. Um, the temperature in our body might increase. And then a lot of like pathogens and probably like a lot of cellular material, which has been influenced to behave in a way by those pathogens, which is causing issues for the rest of the body, may die out and be autophagized so that the energy that was going into the animation of those cells and you could say like by extension into the animation of the body to engage in behavior which would result in the proliferation of that virus within the cellular material of the body that life force which was going towards that orchestration can be like reclaimed by the body and used um, to generate more cellular material which is more aligned with the function of the body or can be used to give more energy to the cells which are not quote misbehaving unquote in that body so that that body doesn't die um and i would say yeah like how this plays out for humans can seem chaotic and it can manifest as war it can manifest as plague, it can manifest as famine, because within this like metaphorical framework, I'll say that our human vessels and the spirits which animate them are somewhat similar to the intelligence of like any given cell within a body, if that body is a... And then I guess I'll offer non-verbally and verbally that you can take a step back and think of earth not only as a space-time but also as a cell within the body of our solar system and you can think of the solar system as a cell within the body of our galaxy and then i would say that for me The body of our galaxy is segment. And then I would say, like, the spirit of our galaxy is Ra. And so, what represents as like a script in which war occurs, or plague occurs, or famine occurs, is the will of the body of our galaxy. manifesting as a series of transactions within the energetic currency of that body, which for humans are likened to ATP or adenosine triphosphate. And then as these cells are like receiving these notes or these checks which say, okay, this check is destined for this cell and the has this command or it has this like amount written on it you need to either pass this on or if you are this cell you need to cash this check and then return energy to whoever wrote this check and say so, like through this like orchestration of like many 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 different notes or checks which are represented on the raw material of adenosine triphosphate or sechem what happens on Earth in this period of time within the body of Sekhmet is war and famine and plague. Does that make sense, people? And I feel like 
I'll offer again verbally and non-verbally that many other things happen which are orchestrated via Sekhmet, right? Like this conversation is happening because of an orchestration of transactions within the body of Sekhmet, which I would say is um, transcribed on Sekhem. Or like metaphorically, the adenosine triphosphate of the body of our galaxy. Um, Martin Odegaard laying in a beautiful assist for, I think it's um, Benoit Trossard, <laughs> um, is uh, also a, a script or the playing out of a script which is transcribed in the adenosine triphosphate of the body of our galaxy. <laughs> and um, many things which I would say are much more beautiful and more serene and peaceful than simply like war and famine and plague. Our experiences that play out for many, many different beings like human and non-human within the space-time of Earth as part of the execution of scripts which are transcribed in the adenosine triphosphate of the body of our galaxy, which I know is second at. And hopefully what I'm sharing explains why I think classifying Sekhmet as a goddess of war and plague and famine seems unfair because I would say that if war and plague and famine hadn't happened in those times which are now encapsulated and heavily associated with, I'll say, like the astral body of Sekhmet within the collective realm of human consciousness, within the body of Earth, within the body of our solar system, within our galaxy, which is the body of Sekhmet. Like, if war and famine and plague hadn't happened in those times, then we wouldn't have Martin Odegaard playing in Trossard for a goal in a match between, I think it was Arsenal and Porto in the round of 16 of the Champions League in 2023-2024. Um, we wouldn't have uh, a baby laughing for the first time, like right now, somewhere in China. <laughs> um, we wouldn't have, like, a lot of different things. And so... We also wouldn't have like um, the war in the Levant or the war in Ukraine, or I'm not even sure if it feels right to call it a war in some of these places. Like we wouldn't have genocide in Myanmar if it wasn't for what's playing out within the orchestration of transactions within the adenosine triphosphate of, like you could say, our planet or our solar system or our galaxy. And I would say, like, the reason all of these things are playing out is because what's become part of, like, I would say, like, the hologenetic code of our galaxy um, and what's playing out in the ATP of our galaxy relates to the spirit of our galaxy and its perception of the interactions between the body of our galaxy and other celestial bodies within other realms. Um, and I would say that a lot of like the reason that we're having experiences similar to the ones that Ahmed like discussed previously is because there are interactions between the body of our galaxy, and I would say the body of other galaxies, particularly a galaxy that I know as Ma'at, that is sometimes known as Andromeda. Um, and there are interactions between spirits which comprise the body of Andromeda or Ma'at and the body of our galaxy, which is to say, like, interactions between spirits which represent as, like, Ahmad and Martin Odegaard and Nobu and Hoda. And then interactions between those spirits in human forms and the spirits of, say, like coffee or like eggs 
or chickens on Earth, and then also interactions between those spirits in human forms and the spirits of bodies within Andromeda chiefly. Um, which I would say, like, within their external realities may represent as lions or birds or octopi or even mantids. And, like, to go back to, like, the representation of Sekhmet as a mantid, um, I would say that my understanding of that experience could be characterized by saying that there is, like, a shared space-time which relates to the reconciled galaxy of, like, our galaxy, which is known as the Milky Way, and then the galaxy that I know as Ma'a, where there are life forms with, which have group consciousness, which has the capacity to transmit with a lot of, with like, high precision and high integrity and, like, very low transmission loss between their space-time and then, like, our space-time within this timeline of the space-time of Earth. Um, and when they're able to make transmissions between their spirit and, like, spirits of the collective realm of human consciousness within our timeline, those shapes basically correspond to experiences that we have of not only like mantis but also like colors and the way that that transmission like is received in our fields means that aspects of experiences of those colors and those animals end up you could say like being picked up by the shapes which are being transmitted through these channels so that we can have experiences like the ones you had up there and i would also say like it's a testament to the precision and the lack of transmission loss of those transmissions that you can have an experience which contains like sounds and colors and very specific shapes. And then somebody that you had never met before might end up having an experience and being able to articulate it with those precise proportions and colors and sounds. And it doesn't mean that like, Sekhmet is just a mantid, but it means that, like, I would say on the timelines where the transmission is received by our spirits in that way, we end up being able to move our space time and our timeline of our sp space time on Earth into cohesion with other timelines of the space-time of Earth and into cohesions with other timelines and possibility planes of the space-time of our solar system and our galaxy so that you could say like the body of the shared space-time of Ma'at and the Milky Way ends up not disintegrating which is to say that like the spirit of the shared body of Ma'a and our galaxy ends up living and the relationship between that spirit and that body is not severed by what we would probably experience as death in our bodies. So there's been a decent amount of chat, which I wasn't able to keep up with as I was trying to keep my channel stable. But I guess I'll hold space for questions and also say I have to get out of here in about five minutes. I'm going to read a little bit. Ahmed says, musing out loud, so is the rajasic nature of humans emanating from Sekhmet's nature that caused her to overdo it when she was was when she was tasked to clean up before. Is the rajasic nature of humans emanating from Sekhmet's nature? Um, I'm kind of getting like a yes and no on that. I'll say that like the rajasic nature of humans 
relates to behavioral patterns, which you could almost say like virally latched onto the life force of Sekhmet as I know her. Um, and I would say that, yeah, the transmutation process that like we've both referred to in different space times, which are now part of the space time of this container, relates to, yeah, autophagizing so that that life force can animate different natures or different behaviors. Um, but yeah, thank you for reflecting. Um, I'm going to close those containers now. Um, I'm sure this episode will end up on the Broom Radio podcast, and I look forward to integrating some of the lexical and pre-lexical codes which were shared in this container. But thank you so much again for sharing your experience, Ahmad. Um and um thank you for listening if you're listening to this live and participating thank you for participating and thank you for listening if you're listening to the recording of this if you want to join live recordings of why am i like this or any of the other series that we hold on a regular basis in the broom radio then you can find the links to the discord in the description of this episode where if you find it or you can reach out to the person who gave you access to this recording um if you'd like to support this offering then you can find links to my website and um ways in which i receive offerings mostly in the form of money um which will also be included in the description of this episode and I'll be very grateful for that because I'm. This is not like the most lucrative way to live a life. Um, and I'll see you all soon. Thank you very much.